Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, we continue our series on how Governor Wolf's proposed new fiscal year budget affects you. We're going to look at transportation. We're going to look at hospitals and health care. We'll do all of that after these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Well, the legislature continues its hearings on Governor Wolf's what I've called very bold and ambitious agenda, his budget, his budget proposal agenda. We're taking a look at pieces of that, and, and these affect literally every Pennsylvanian not just voters, every Pennsylvanian in this, in this state is in one way or another affected by uh, Governor Wolf's proposal. Joining me is often, as often as the case is Bob Latham. He's the executive vice president of the Associated Pennsylvania Constructors. We call Bob in to talk about, guess what, roads, bridges, and mass transit. I don't think we get subjects more important than that in these days. All right, Bob, give us a quick overview. Construction, I still see the people in those. I can never get the color right, but they're all over the place doing the roads yeah. and bridges. Oh, Let's give look, us an look, update. Look, look for the orange barrels and the guys in green and stay clear of them and drive okay. slowly through work zones. Thank uh, you. Last year, of course, we, uh, we had on the heels of Act 89, the Comprehensive Transportation Bill uh, that passed raised about $2.3 billion, which I might add was a billion short of needs that were, were mm -hmm. identified, but we attacked the roads. We had that horrible winter in 2014 and got the got roads paved. Now right. we're gonna hopefully be able to start to attack some of our bridges, but uh, there is some concern with, uh, with where we're going with the Act 89 money and how it might be being used in other directions. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Right. But, it, but, I mean, is it, it, in terms of the, the quantity of it, I mean, every place I turn, I see it. Well, the reason for that is because we're not building new roads. I mean, what we're doing is we are repairing existing yeah. roads. And one of the problems we had was for about five or six years prior to that, when we didn't have the money to do it right, we were just putting thin overlays, kind of keeping things patched yeah. together. Now we got to go back and really do it right, get the under drain, get is the this surface. I'm sorry. Finish How long is thought. this? How long are we going to be doing this? Well, I mean, we have 40,000 miles of road in Pennsylvania. We've got about 25% of it that needs to be repaired. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be quite some and time. I'll tell you. Our geology is just such that, that we, it freezes and thaws. We freeze and thaw, and we're to, we're, we have to repair our system. It's just kind of like, you know, your driveway, your house, or yep. whatever. It wears yep. out. You have to keep it up to date. All right. One of the concerns that have, have been expressed is, and this has been going on in different funds of, in state government for some time, time, uh, I, want, I want you to talk a little bit about is our funds being diverted that from the purposes that you just described to the use for other state programs, obviously to deal with the budget deficit, you know, the structural deficit in the state. What's your concern about that? Well, our concern is that, first of all, uh, when the voters what I would say, approved of the legislature and, and the governor in, in 2013 increasing highway user fees through gas taxes. They were looking at that as we know the money's going to go on to road repair. Now, what we're seeing, <clears throat> what we call the motor license fund, which is where your gas tax money, your license fees, your registration fee money goes, is supposed to go primarily for, for highway improvements. What we're seeing is some diversion of that, continued, I would say, increases in diversion of that for two programs, particularly the state police budget and then also some for the Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. We're not questioning the need for those programs whatsoever. The state police, obviously a vital function, uh, something that needs, you know, the, the, we, we need money for troopers, we need, mm -hmm. we need protection. But there's a couple of things going on here, and that is, first of all, we're looking at uh, you know yet another seven, uh, sixty some million dollars being proposed to be diverted out of the motor license fund. So that's projects that won't happen. That's safety improvements that won't happen on on interchanges as a, as a result of that. Right. And that makes a total almost three quarters of a billion dollars that's coming out of the motor license Does fund for state police. And there are a couple of things basically just their, their operations beyond what they do on the roads that are being funded right. now. And then, of course, we have this issue where a lot of municipalities 
rely on the state police and they don't pay property taxes because they for uh, their local policing. In other words, you may live in a town that has a regional police force or a borough or township police force and, and, and the neighboring township doesn't. They don't pay for that. That comes out of the motor license. Yeah, form. and that's the state police that are in there. Okay. We're going to run to a break. When we, we come back, I'm, I want to talk a little more about that. I also mm -hmm. want to get your sense I'm going to, you're, you're, you're going to be a prognosticator. I want to ask you about where all this goes. A, a, a tough budget. Everybody admits that. Big structural deficits. Over the course of decades now, money has been diverted from, you know, taking it away from, and we understand it's not necessarily sure. for a bad purpose, but the impact that that's going to have on what you're talking about. Sure. All right, I'm chatting with uh, Bob Latham. We'll be back and continue this discussion. Roads, bridges, mass transit. It's tough to find a subject more important to this. Well, we're going to talk about hospitals and health care. we got a bunch of important subjects. We'll do that in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. I'm talking with Bob Latham. We're talking about roads, bridges, and mass transit. All right, Bob. Uh, I mean, what you've talked about here, I think, is pretty important because if this, the more diversion of this money, the fewer of these projects get completed, and it just makes the situation worse for the roads and bridges. I know that just driving through cities, as, as you know, I, I drive around this state, I don't remember urban areas, I mean, with potholes, you know, a foot, th roads all torn up in the municipalities. Not just the sure. big state interstate highways, not the major state roads. Have well, you ever seen roads this this in bad, this kind of shape? Well, the funding bill that passed uh, almost uh, a couple of years ago now also had included a lot of money, additional money for municipalities. So hopefully they'll be able to to attack that. Um, our concern again. Back in, back in the day, I guess, if you will, we had the Highway Patrol, um, which was part of the state police. And this, so there, there, there is a portion of the motor license fund that rightfully should pay for the state police. But what right. we've seen over the years is this growth, growth and you know, continued uh, increase there in order to offset general fund spending. Right. And if the current trend lines continue, we're going to be well over a billion dollars I mean, that's like 15 cents worth of your, your gas tax going not on the roads, but going for a primarily a general fund purpose. So your point would be that if, if this is a need, then the legislature ought to fund that separately. Exactly. And We're looking leave at the all, roads and bridge money where it belongs. We right? have a massive tax proposal or a comprehensive uh, general fund tax proposal on the table. Uh, we think we should look at, for, you know, at funding a portion, uh, you know, yeah. a greater portion of the state police out of that general fund proposal, as opposed to continuing to draw yeah. it out yeah. of the out of the fund that motorists approved uh, the increase right. in order to pay for road improvements. As you point out, we have a, a lot to do. Yeah. If it grows to a billion dollars, that's the shortfall that was identified and not addressed right. by Act. So your point would be. When the money gets appropriated for one thing, it should be used for that, not diverted into other funds. And I want to ask you to get into other, you know, other areas. But that isn't that your That's big point. That's a general point? premise. I mean, we've always yeah. we've always had the user of the roads paid for the roads. If the user of the roads starts paying for something yeah. else, then you sort of break faith with the is, motorists. Is there anything? And if you don't know, have an answer to this, I certainly understand it. Is there anything in the Wolf budget that helps alleviate this? The proposal that he has. Or is it will still continue to be this diversion that no, you're talking the, the, about? Uh, the proposed budget has another sixty some million dollars, at least you know, equal to one penny of the gas tax going over, over and above. Previous All right. Before years. I let you go, the federal government has a major responsibility here in the Highway Trust Fund. When I think about it, it's always the Ike, Eisenhower, and the huge interstate 
probably the biggest massive construction effort of roads in the history of the state or country. Am I right about that? Absolutely. And once so again, you know, the interstate system is uh, is struggling. It's not, mo it needs to be modernized. It's falling apart in some cases. And we have a lot of miles of interstate here in Pennsylvania. There is the National Highway Trust Fund that needs to be funded. Yeah. Congress has till May 31st. And what have they come up with so far? Nothing. Yeah. Uh, we're advocating, our Keystone Transportation Funding Coalition is talking to our delegation about looking at what we did in Pennsylvania. We did away with the uh, cents per gallon at the, at the pump, moved it upstream at the distributor or perhaps the refinery level at the national level mm -hmm. and, uh, and increase the user fee at that level. There'll be some market absorption and we think that that makes a lot yeah. of sense. That's what we're talking to our delegation well, about. One of, before I let you go, one of the things and on another related topic that, you know, I, I think and, you know, I may get some email and can, and tweets about this. I think the PennDOT overall over the past 40 years has just made dramatic improvement in the operations. I mean, let's be honest. It used to be you'd always have these PennDOT jokes. You don't hear them anymore. I think they've done a lot better job, a lot more professionalization. Is there anything that they could be or should be doing that can help this, or is it just, just a question of the money? It's not, you don't think it's an efficiency problem with construction and with PennDOT. It's about the diversion of the money. For, is that two, for two years or two or three years before we passed Act 89, PennDOT did you know, a lot of self-examination and looked at what they can right. do working in concert with the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission. We've actually got a program called the Innovate, Statewide Innovation Council looking at all these things and how we can do things coordinate better. Coordinate so better. Are better coordination, yeah. uh, coordination with local governments, uh, ways to be more efficient, and they've, uh, they've come up with a I'm merit I'm going to put you on the spot. Am I right or wrong about PennDOT? <laughs> Well, I about think, how much more professional they've gotten. I the think last you're absolutely. Years. I think you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. As far as looking at their efficiencies, they've done a tremendous job yeah. with that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I just see them working, and I mean, I just get mm -hmm. the, and, and hear the reports like you do. At any rate, uh, thanks for coming in on the for the update. All right, we're going to hear from the hospital and health system. We're going to see how Governor Wolf's budget proposal impacts the hospitals of this state. We'll do that after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania, and by the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, representing companies involved in America's most affordable, reliable energy source. To learn more, visit PACoalalliance.com. Well, Paula Broussard with the uh, Hospital and Health Systems of, of Pennsylvania, Health System of Pennsylvania, is, is joining me. She's the chief strategy uh, officer. We're going to talk about how Gover Governor Wolf's budget proposal affects hospitals. And consequently, I think I'm right, Paula, the health care that folks get in the state. Which I think you would agree with that one, right? All right, let's start out with uh, the, the budget itself and how it, how, what does it do, what does it mean, how does it relate, affect hospitals? What, what's the big overview here? Well, the governor's budget, as proposed, actually is proposing cuts in hospital payments for hospitals with obstetrics units, neonatal care, burn care, and it's proposing cuts for our most smallest rural community hospitals. And so we're a bit disappointed in that budget because um, hospitals need to serve those patients. And as you know, Terry, hospitals don't have Medicaid nurses or doctors. When Medicaid cuts, it can impact all of right. our access to care. So let me put it this way. As, as you know, uh, rural hospitals are literally between the patient and, in some respect, virtually not much health care service at all without moving to a, you know, an urban area, you know, getting someplace where you have a considerable commute and a considerable drive. 
and some of them face unusual budget and fiscal situations anyway. Am I right or wrong about that? Oh, absolutely, because the because of the rural nature of the and and the volume variability at those hospitals, they often struggle. So these payments that have been proposed to be cut help stabilize that so they are able to serve their community twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. And we're talking about state as well as federal money too, right? Yes. When the state proposes a cut in state funding for Medicaid it's important to understand then the federal match is not received. So the um, total impact of those particular services that I talked to you about is about 40 million state right. and federal right. dollars. All right. As we know, the delivery of health care services are changing all the time. So the question then is you take the cuts and how they affect the services that hospitals are trying to deliver. How, 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 I hate this word, gosh, impactful. Oh, I hate to use that. <laughs> you smile, but you know it's one of. Well, we look at it more as like an investment because healthcare is changing very rapidly. So you see hospitals providing more outpatient services where we're able to take care of the person and they don't have right. to be admitted or using electronic health records so that the hospital, the physicians, the nursing home can share important information. And when you face cuts, to cover the cost of service, it makes it very hard to invest in those changes, which ultimately are in the best interest of Pennsylvanians and will help us provide care more effectively yeah. into the future. Before I'm, I, I, I want to get into the whole, I mean, it's a huge, uh, it has huge implications, the transfer of uh, the state's Medicaid uh, program from Governor Corbett's healthy PA to what I call traditional Medicaid expansion. You can differ with me on that terminology if you want. Before I move into that and what that means, how does this affect employment in hospitals? You are, and I always talk, I talk about this in, in, when I get out in the road and do some speeches, you get small communities, you got basically in some cases two employers, big employers, hospitals and what I do, right? Colleges and universities. How do, what kind of effect do you think that's going to have? Well, as you know, hospitals are very labor intensive. To take care of patients requires doctors, nurses, physical therapists. And so when hospitals face large payment cuts, it impacts their workforce. There are about 600,000 Pennsylvanians who were either directly or indirectly employed because of hospitals, right. and we provide both career ladders to lots of opportunities, right. but these are family sustaining jobs. And so that's a, of concern when you get into the, the kinds of cuts some hospitals may face. All right, I'm, I'm talking with Paul Broussard. We're gonna to run to a break. There's probably, in the, on the, in the healthcare discussions that we've had in this program and elsewhere, Healthy Pennsylvania, Governor Corbett uh, initiated it. It's, you know, you, you, the government would, federal government would provide a subsidy and people could buy their health insurance on the federal exchange, a couple of different insurers provide options there. That's all going to, it's in the process of being changed. I want to ask Paul about what that means, what, what is likely to happen as this huge transition occurs. I'll, I'll do that uh, after we pay some bills. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine, and by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Business Council and by the Pennsylvania Business Council Education Foundation. All right, well, I'm talking with Paul Broussard. We're going to, this whole business of Medicaid expansion involves hundreds of thousands of Pennsylvanians, something like five or 600,000. I'm sure Paul has, would probably have the exact number. This is where you know lots of folks go to get their primary care. If they don't go there, they're going to end up. They're going to the hospitals, and we know what ex expense that that means. To talk about this, Medicaid expansion. What Governor Wolf's trying to do. What's what's your take on that? 
Well, the hospital community supports expanding Medicaid because we know that if you're uninsured, you're less likely to have a relationship with a physician, use preventive care, and as you said, Terry, you're going to enter the system sicker. So moving Medicaid expansion, giving that coverage is important. The other thing a lot of times people don't understand is the individuals getting the, the coverage under Medicaid largely are people working. They're working at jobs with wages that don't allow them to afford health care or jobs that don't provide health care coverage. So we're actually helping individuals be more productive by um, enrolling them in Medicaid. Yeah. So this transition, I mean, there were uh, well over about 100,000 people under Healthy P. I'm just generalizing now, give or take. They have to uh, they have to go through a transition from that to Medicaid itself without getting into the weeds. We're talking about a lot of people. Is that something that's going to take place over time? It's over the course of this year. The yeah. Wolf administration outlined a time frame. Oh, so they the have good a time news, frame. Yes. The good news is those individuals who got covered under Healthy PA are not going to lose their coverage. And by and large, the plans that were providing care in Healthy PA provide care under the traditional Medicaid program. So uh, hopefully for most of the individuals, it'll be a relatively seamless transition. In the meantime, there are about 400, 500,000 other Pennsylvanians that are eligible. That's a and lot of so people. so the state, the hospital community, and others are working to make sure to people make sure understand what their options are. All right, are. before I let you go, uh, there's a bill in the legislature, and, and it, it's been controversial about who gets to this establish the criteria, the standards for determining tax exemption. Many small communities, cities, for example, ha can have as much as 25% of their property that are tax exempt. Hospitals are tax exempt. What's your concern about that legislation? Well, we think that legislation would be good if the legislation passes, then this fall it would be on the ballot for the public to say, Yes, we want the legislature to, to, to establish decide that as opposed standards. to the courts. Do I got that right? Exactly, because the courts, there's 67 counties, lots of municipalities. You can get very different Bar kinds yeah. of approaches. Right. And then that makes it confusing for United Way, YWCAs, health centers, hospitals, colleges right. to know what standards do we need to meet to merit tax exemption. Okay. I want to th uh, 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 th thanks, thanks for this update. One of the things that I think we'll have you back at a future time when we get closer to the point where this could be on the ballot. This, this affects a lot of municipalities, as you point out, and the money that they get raised. But we'll get you back and you can bring us up to date on that. All right. We'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And as always, you stay well.